Daniel chapter 3. We're going to start by reading just verse 7. It says, it says, Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sacred, psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for these people in this place, this place that you've given them to worship you and serve you. We pray, God, that you'll help us to be nothing more than a mouthpiece for you today, Father. We pray, God, that you'll uh, use us to serve your people and strengthen your people so that we can go out and do your will, Father, in this world. We love you and ask these things in your precious, precious name. Amen. When I read the third chapter of Daniel, it reminds me so much of the United States today in that uh, Nebuchadnezzar didn't dictate that they couldn't worship their gods. He just dictated that for the purposes of unity, they must worship this image that they put together, right? The Israelites were in a tough position because they were Babylonians but they were also citizens of the nation of Israel. So they had two standards that they were expected to meet. And we, like Israel, find ourselves in that same spot oftentimes, don't we? We're children of God. We're citizens of heaven, but we're also citizens of the United States. The guiding principles. Now, let's back up. The, the Patriots' duty. I want to speak about the Babylonian Patriots this morning. The Patriots' duty is to do what is best for his country according to the principles that guide him, according to the principles of his life that he knows is true and the best way to go, right? The guiding principles of our individual lives are how a patriot determines what's in the best interest of the country. Now, it wouldn't, you as a patriot, wouldn't take on someone else's ideology about what's, they think is best for the country when you disagree with it. It's not a patriot. The Chaldeans, in fact, in this particular, if you know the, the story, the Chaldeans were patriots because they were promoting what they believed to be best for Babylon. The nation of Israel were not patriots that day. They weren't patriots to their country that day, and they weren't patriots to the Lord that day because they allowed their fears to overcome their guiding principles, and they didn't do what a patriot would do in terms of doing what they believed in their heart was best for the country. I fear too often that we as Americans, and especially we as American Christians, fall into that same category. We believe that we're patriots. We call ourselves patriots, but too often because of fear, or social influences, or finances, or whatever our individual situation may be, we fall like the Israelites that day and bow to the, the idols of America, uh, giving up our responsibility and the things that we know are best for our country based on our godly principles. We do that often. Anytime we see someone's failure in Scripture, as we do here today with the Israelites, God's faithful to always give us an example of how it should be done. And he does here in this passage also. Let's look at that example as to how we can be patriots, both of the U.S. and of heaven, by applying our, our interests that we know are correct and we know are faithful uh, to, to our Americanism. Let's look at uh, verse 12 first. These godly Babylonian patriot examples applied their guiding principles to their lives. Verse 12 says, there are certain Jews, and this is the Chaldean speaking to the king, there are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the providence of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not guarded thee, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Let me say this first before we get in it, just based on this passage. We oftentimes refer to uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as the three Hebrew children. Or, uh, you know, the, the ch children is always attached to their names. They're not children. This passage says that they were men. 
They stood up as men for the Lord. And I believe if we think about this, if we realize the fact that we are in a war and there's only two entities in this world that control anything, God and Satan, right? All you have to do is look at who profits from whatever happens to determine who's behind it. So if scripture tells us that three, these three men were men, but for some some way it's gotten in that they're children, and, and that's gotten in to diminish the fact of what they did, who's behind that? It's Satan, right? So we have to we have to discern absolutely everything that comes our way because we're at war and our, our enemy is a great tactician and he'll do things like that to inhibit and prohibit and, and diminish the word of God. So these men were leaders in Babylon government. That's what the passage tells us. They were set over the kingdom's affairs so that you must believe that they cared about the country. They cared about what happened to this country. They were they're in a position of leadership. We see that when something contrary to their guiding principles rose, they acted in accordance with their guiding, guiding principles. That's what it says here. The Chaldeans are saying, hey, king, they're not doing what you told them to do. So we see that the, the, they're, they're acting in uh, contrast to what the, guiding, the, the king told them to do. We also see that, and, and folks, we also see some things that we do uh, commonly, especially in Christendom, because nobody wants to be a weakling. We all want to stand up and, and have our voices heard. We see some things that they do here that we often fail at. We also see that they didn't raise an army against their country and desire a fight to try and change things. We do that often, don't we? They simply recognize that the dictate by their government was contrary to scripture, and then they followed scripture. That's what they did. They didn't all the other things that we often do. Another important point to note is that they're not even the ones that brought up the fact that they were following scripture, not the king's dictate. Now, what do we do often? Something goes wrong in Washington, and the first thing we do is want to uh, tell our friends and family in whatever format that we do it, how where we stand and how stupid those other people are, and that uh, I stand here because I'm a Christian. That's not what these guys did, did they? They did. They said, okay, we see that the country's going this way. Scripture tells me to go this way. I'm going to do what Scripture tells me and let God handle that. It's not what we do. That's what our example says to do. Let's look at verse 12, or excuse me, 14 and 15. These godly Babylonian patriot examples were willing to face the consequences of godly principles. Nebuchadnezzar, in verse 14, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning fiery furnace and who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands I want you to consider this and I told you already there's only two controlling interests in the world and you only need to look to who profits to determine who's behind it. I want you to consider this Satan didn't want them in that furnace Satan didn't want them in the furnace Satan wanted to use the furnace to, to, to make them do what Satan wanted them to do. So I ask you, whose furnace was it? I want you to consider this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be cast in the furnace that day. He wanted them to violate scripture and worship the item. That's what, that's what he wanted. We think all the time Satan was trying to put them in the furnace and God came in and rescued them. No, that was God's furnace. God wanted them in that furnace so his will could be fulfilled. God's furnaces are for us. They're good for us. Look, he proves himself to us in the furnaces, and he proves them himself to others in the furnace. When we are willing to get in the furnace as these guys were, he's able to work. He's able to 
prove himself to us. He's able to use us to prove himself to other people, just like he did in this passage, as we'll find. Satan used the fear of the furnace as a weapon to try and get him to do what he wanted him to do. He wanted them to fall to the idol, like everybody else did. God wanted them in the furnace so he could use them. And it's, it's important. Look, folks, sometimes, especially in a small church like this where you're just starting, it may seem like you're in a furnace sometimes. It may seem like you are getting tormented. It may seem like a tough place to be. And it is. But you know what? That's where God wants you. Because that's where God's going to use you. And that's where he can magnify himself. It's about magnifying him. It's not about magnifying ourselves. We want to get to the war. Be mindful that the fear that you have when you're faced with a godly furnace is the same fear that Satan tried to use against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego back then. He, he finds a tactic that works and he uses it. And it still works today too often. To present a fear if I don't do this, this is what's going to happen to me. And we forget about our heavenly patriotism and become United States patriots for that particular period of time. He uses that tactic. Don't be afraid of it. This is an example of what God will do for us if we follow his, his direction in these situations and allow him to put us in a furnace every once in a while. Let's look at verse 16 through 18. These, got, these godly Babylonian patriot examples trusted God in the face of persecution. Verse 16 says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we served is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up acting on their godly principles for what they believe to be in the best interest of the country. And in the face of persecution, these men trusted God. There were four fragment statements that were made in these passages that gave us direction on how to handle these situations. And I want to look at them. And these are things that we often don't do. They referred to Nebuchadnezzar as O king. They're, they weren't antagonistic uh, towards the king. They respected his position and they referred to him as king. If they had been antagonistic towards the king or called him some of the things that we hear, and believe me, I don't agree. I'm a, I'm a veteran, uh, conservative Christian Republican from West Virginia. So you know where I lie on many things. I don't agree with everything that happens in Washington. But this passage teaches us not to be antagonistic and, and, and fightful toward them. It would have, if they had been antagonistic toward the king, just as it is if we're antagonistic now, it lessens our ability to reach them with the gospel. Hey, when we're upset with something that's happening in Washington and we act the, the way we often do, every person. In Washington, every person that supports what happens in Washington, we have just made an enemy and lost all opportunity to reach them with the gospel. And I submit to you today that your job is not to fix politics in right. Washington. Good Our team. job is not to fix politics in Cookville. Our job is not to fix Facebook. Our job is not to fix the things that go on in our, our work. Our job is to give people the gospel. And if we do these things, we're unable to do that as effectively as we once were because we did these things. And who's behind that? Who profits from that? Being derogatory to those differing opinions is a weapon that Satan often uses. And we often, too often, fall for it. And it prevents us from reaching people who think differently than we are, than we do. Let me tell you, before we started doing this, I was a judge in West Virginia, a county judge, and I had murderers before me. I had uh, pedophiles before me, addicts, addicts, name it. Atheists, abortionists, murderers, addicts, pedophiles are not our enemy. They're not. They're the victims of our enemy. We often treat them like the enemy 
And because we do that, we're unable to reach them. our only job, folks. Our job is not to. I hate abortion as much as the next guy, but my job is not to fix the abortion issue. That's God's job. Right. My job is to present the gospel to those people. And guess what? That's how you fix the abortion issue. That's how you fix all those issues that we talked about. We mess up too often, especially in these times when there's so much conflict within by, by not remembering what our job is. They did, so, so they treated the king with the respect that his office regarded. They didn't have to consider their answer. They said this. They said, we're not careful to answer thee in this matter. We're not careful to answer you in this matter. You know what that means in hillbilly language? King, I ain't got to think about this. I don't have to think about it. They knew they were living so close to God already that they knew what to do when faced with a challenge like this. Our God is the epitome of strength, and it's truly a sign of weakness, folks. It's truly a sign of weakness when faced with something that's obviously contrary to Scripture for us to say anything other than what they just said. You know, for Christians to say, I have to think about something or I have to pray about something that's obviously contrary to Scripture tells me one of two things. We're either not allowing the Holy Spirit to lead, lead our lives or we're considering the sin. I mean, there is no other answer. There are things that come up in your life that I'll have to pray about that. Well, the Lord says in the scripture already to do these things. We don't have to pray about it. These are standing orders. These are things we're supposed to be doing. If something comes up at work or, or in the family or out in town that you know to be in conflict with scripture, there's nothing to think about. These folks didn't think about it. They said, we're not careful to answer thee in this matter, King. We don't, I ain't got to think about it. Scripture says, don't do it. We're not going to do it. We make that mistake all the time, and it makes us appear weak as people. It makes us appear weak as God's people. It makes us appear weak as the, the people of the one who created and controls everything. It causes us to appear weak before him. And these folks were already living right, and they knew exactly how to answer the king in this matter. They trusted God. Our God, they said this. They said, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us. But if not, this might be my favorite passage in all of Scripture right here. Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us. But if not, they didn't fear the consequences of their faithfulness to God because they trusted, listen now, they trusted that whatever happened, live, die, or otherwise, it was going to be God's will. And because it was God's will, it was in their best interest because it was God's will. Hey. Put me in the, can, in, in the furnace. God will take care of me. But if not, it must be what God wants for my life. And I might not physically like it, but I know it's what's best for me. If we applied that to our lives daily, I'm telling you this, you would be much happier. You would be so much happier if you just said, you know what? Here's what the world's throwing at me. Here's what scripture says to do. So that's what I'm going to do. And whatever comes, comes. And I know it's what's best for me because that's what God said for me to do. And he knows best. And I belong to him. We live our individual lives. If we live our individual lives, trusting God and acting on that trust, we're then patriots. Because our, our interactions with government will be used, uh, will be based on what God directs us to do. You understand that the sweet spot of Christianity is simply trusting and following the Lord, following his directions and not fearing. Live. Could you imagine living your life with no worry or no fear? That's what God wants us to do. And he says to do that, just trust me. Just trust me. So to be a patriot of both the United States and heaven, we have to live our individual lives trusting God and applying scripture to our, our patriotism in both fashions. And if we do that, we're patriot both to the United States and to uh, heaven. 
But I submit to you that we're not patriots to either most of the time. We like to we like to tout ourselves as being conservative, patriot, Christian, on the right, doing what we're not. Because if we did, we'd we'd shut our mouth often. We shut our mouth a lot more than we do. But no, we want to we want to tell them how how we stand and why we stand there. For what purpose? To boast ourselves. Who's behind that? Because it prevents us from being able to give people the gospel. Satan's behind it. We're in a war. He's a tactician. These godly Babylonian patriots changed a nation. You want to change this nation? Let's look at what happens here in verses 28 through 30. You want to change America? Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So we know God, he, he put them in the furnace, in God's furnace. We know that he sees God in there and, he, and, and God takes care of them. Not a hair on their head. Didn't even smell like smoke. Verse 28. Here's what Nebuchadnezzar says after that. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants and trusted him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree. Here's where the nation gets changed. Therefore, I make a decree that every people nation and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made a dunghill because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the providence of Babylon. Imagine this. Could you imagine our leaders right now saying those words. Could you imagine them saying, therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut into pieces and their houses shall be made a dunghill because there is no other God. Could you imagine our leaders saying that? You know why they don't? Because we're not doing what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. We're not doing we're not showing them how to how to trust God so that they will see how God takes care of us. And then they will say, he's the true God. That's why it's not them. It's us. We got too far from what scripture tells us to do. We all know that in verse 19 through 27, they were cast in the furnace and God saved them from the furnace. I submit to you that God saving them from the furnace is not the victory in this, this passage. We read this and we've read it and I've been taught for years. The victory in this passage is that God saved those children because they were his children. No, the victory in this passage is that a nation changed and God got, got the glory for it because they were willing to get in there. That's the victory in this passage. Because godly patriots because of godly patriots, a nation was changed. Want to change our nation? We have to become godly patriots. Because godly patriots allow God to prove himself through them, more godly patriots were created. I imagine everybody there became a godly patriot, if not because of what they saw, but because of what the king told them to do after that. All those folks that, I guarantee you this, all those folks that bowed down when the king said, do it, I bet you they also started worshiping this God when he said, I'm going to cut you into pieces if you don't. And it was all because godly men did what they were supposed to do. Let me ask you this. Do you want to change the nation? Do you want to influence other people? Do you think, do you think three chapters later when Daniel had to get in the lion's den, you think he was thinking about Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and what God did for him? Just three chapters later, he was in a lion's den and he had no problem going in there, did he? You know why? Because godly patriots set the example for him to follow and he saw what God would do for him, just like that he did for them if he followed God's directions. Do you think it was more or less difficult for these men's children and grandchildren 
to be a godly patriot after seeing what happened with their father and grandfather? Was it more or less difficult for their children after seeing what happened with dad? How God took care of dad? Less difficult. Yeah. Because they set the example and they were able to learn from God from their father's lessons instead of having to experience it themselves. Now we do that same thing. We have the opportunity to do that. Just keep messing up. So why do you think our country continues to spiral downhill and, and every generation gets further and further away from uh, God? Do you think it'll be more or less difficult for your children and grandchildren, yours, to be godly patriots if you are? Be less difficult for them. It'd be less difficult for our children and grandchildren so we can turn the tide. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego turned the tide in Babylon. They did because they trusted God and God was able to prove himself not only to the uh, king, but them and the, and the rest of the people. So in closing, I want to read a verse to you here. Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14 says this. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will hear their, heal their land. You want to heal this land? God's given us an example of people who wanted to and they did. He's told us what to do to get to the place where those people were. That's just for us to do it. The reason America is in the shape that it's in today is because for too long, Christians have applied two different standards to our patriotism. Sometimes the American standard, sometimes the heavenly standard, leaving us patriots to neither country. The path to patriotism isn't worrying and fighting about the direction of the country. It's not. <laughs> Nothing you say or do is going to change the country in the way that we've been doing it right. The path to patriotism and changing the country is applying godly principles to our, our patriotism. I challenge you to apply godly principles to your patriotism and then let's truly, we use a catchphrase, I challenge you to, to apply godly principles to your patriotism, and then we will truly, truly make America great again.